the NDP and it continued. Hello, hello. Now, obviously, it's on. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a warm welcome uh, after the break. Hopefully, it was very nice for you and you had, you had the opportunity for networking. I think that's the main importance. It's not the question that you are getting good food. You should networking doing, and I think that's quite okay. So far, after the lunch break, we are continuing. The title is Lampedusa, European Responsibility at Stake, which is a real challenging uh, theme for us Europeans, because what is happening since a longer time in Lampedusa is really blaming our continent. It had to be said quite straight, and I'm extremely grateful to the organizers that they are putting on under this title. For sure, we have to speak more about refugees, migration, and so on and so on. That's a general theme. And in this context, I welcome the members of the panel. Uh, it is uh, following the alphabet. Tareke Burhane, beg, beg your pardon if I'm spelling it not in the right way. He's spokesperson of the 3rd of October committee uh, from Italy, but he's from Eritrea. Oliviero Forti from Caritas Italiana uh, Migration Office. I regret that Giuseppina uh, Maria Nicolini, the mayor of Lampedusa, didn't do it, but she is quite needed at home concerning the situation. A warm welcome to the member of the European Parliament, Michel Raymond. Uh, I think I want to add, he is in the committee of the European Parliament for Syria and Jordan. Uh, I think quite a very challenging part, and he is to do a very good job. And I have to apologize. Last but not least, uh, Elisabeth Tichy Fisselberger, uh, she is the Director General for Legal and Consular Affairs at the Austrian Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and she has quite a long experience in all these subjects for sure. I think uh, I'm telling you how we would handle it. Uh, the first uh, taking the floor will be Tarek Burhane. He's showing also some spots, uh, some movies for a closer information, I think twice. Uh, I think uh, he will get a little bit more time, but for the others I'm asking to do it within five minutes, that we have a possibility to exchange views in the panel and to give you the opportunity to raise questions. I think the time will not be enough because we have to close at 3 o'clock, and at 3 o'clock uh, this meeting is continued. So if I again a warm welcome, uh, having the convictions that we are touching an extremely important subject here on this panel. Uh, I may ask Tarek Brahane to start. I think he will be translated as far as I know. No, it's in English now. It's in English, how about you? Now let us proceed with the ceremony of the Peace Summit Medal for Social Activism. This medal is given to each summit to a courageous social activist working in the country in which the summit is held. This medal intends to give a voice to a hero or heroine from the civil society itself. I would like to call on the podium Nobel Peace Laureate Leymag Bowie to read the motivation for the Peace Summit Medal Award. I have many um, distinct titles, and I think the reason why my co-laureate, Jody, asked me to do this is because one of the titles I have is being an ex-refugee. Tariki was born in Eritrea, where he studied and worked since the age of 10 to sustain his mother. When he was 17, he fled from Eritrea to avoid forced military conscription for life. For him to leave his country was not an easy choice. 
and the risks he faced were numerous. His journey lasted years, and he faced death, violence, and imprisonment while he was crossing Sudan and Libya. During his first attempt to cross the Mediterranean, he was rejected until at the end of 2005, finally, Tharike was able to reach Sicily. Since then, he has always been committed to helping those who, like him, were forced to face dangerous journey in order to escape from unbearable and dramatic situations with the hope of obtaining protection in Europe. Tarike worked as a cultural mediator in Lampedusa in southern Italy for Save the Children and Doctors Without Borders. Today, he lives in Rome where he is married and has two children, Michelle and Simone. He assists asylum seekers and is president of the 3rd October Committee, a nonprofit organization founded in the aftermath of the tragedy at Lampedusa in which 368 persons lost their lives. The aim of the organization is to obtain recognition of a day of remembrance to be celebrated every 3rd October at national and European level to honor all migrants who perish at sea and those who risk their lives in order to save them. Tareke will be awarded the Medal Peace Summit for Social Activism for dedicating himself to raising awareness on refugee issues in Italy after being a refugee himself and for creating the 3rd October Committee so that the victims will not be forgotten. Congratulations to my brother Tariki. You may please come up. From one, from one African to the other, your inspiration gives me hope, gives the women of Africa hope, gives the continent of Africa hope and the rest of the world hope that our struggle and the struggles like people, of people like Mandela is not in vain because we have a whole generation who will turn that continent back upright. Congratulations. God bless you. Grazie, grazie. Well, thank you, really, I'm truly honored of receiving this medal from uh, uh, the, uh, were, uh, the Nobel Peace Laureate Summit. I would like to thank my uh, co-workers uh, in uh, the October 3rd Committee and all those who have supported us and shared our dreams and goals. I would like to thank Italy for having saved hundreds of thousands of people. I would like to uh, dedicate this uh, medal to all uh, the victims, uh, you know, the immigrants who died at sea, and uh, to their families. In the last 20 years, about 20,000 people have perished while they were trying to reach Europe by sea. These were people who were uh, fleeing from violence and war. This uh, slaughter I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm overwhelmed by emotion. <laughs> so this uh, massive loss of life uh, can be avoided. But people 
will uh, keep risking their lives at sea until a tangible solution is found to their plight. From this stage, I would like to appeal to all the uh, Nobel uh, Peace laureates to ask Europe and Italy to find alternatives, alternative solutions for these people. This year, about 3,500 people have died uh, between uh, January until now, January of this year. This is why we must protect these people. We have to protect not borders, but human beings. Thank you once again. Caro Dareke, congratulazione. I think this medal is quite an honor and it is also a challenge, not only for you, but for us all, I think, to deal with this situation. So I'm asking you to take the floor for further comments if you want. Okay, grazie. Sono davvero onorato di essere qua con voi. Thank you very much. I'm truly honored to be here with you today. Stato emozionante da uscire dall'Italia, portare le difficoltà, quelle che stiamo vivendo in Italia, portarle qua da voi. And it's very emotionally uh, satisfying for me to come here from, it to, from Italy to Austria to tell you about the things that we are experiencing. Vi parlo, non siete come austrici, però come siete cittadini europei. I'm talking to you not as Austrian citizens but the citizens of Europe. Lampedusa è vostra, è vostra Lampedusa, non è perché Italia sta in Italia, è di vostra anche Lampedusa. Because Lampedusa is yours as well, it's not just an island in Italy, but it's yours, it belongs to you as well. Non possiamo andare avanti così, manca il vostro aiuto, manca la vostra sensibilità. We can't go on like this. We need your help. We need your sensitivity and compassion. Adesso tutti siamo in grado di usare internet, Facebook, Google. Basta una ricerca, avete tutte le informazioni a disposizione. Today, of course, we can all use internet, Facebook, Google. You have all the information that you want, that you want at your fingertips, just a few clicks away. E dov'è la vostra umanità? Noi parliamo di persone, non parliamo di muri, di persone. Anche i muri hanno delle storie. But what is your humanity? We're talking about people here. We're not talking about walls. Of course, walls have their story as well, but we're talking about human beings. Qual è la differenza fra me e voi? Io sono nato in Eritrea, sono condannato a nascere lì, crescere lì, subire la, la, la sofferenza, la violenza e morire lì. Voi siete nati a Venna, avete diritto, prendere il volo vai dove, dove volete. Dove la eguaglianza? Secondo voi è giusto? What is the difference between you and me? I was born in Eritrea. I suffered violence. I suffered deprivation. I was in danger of my life. You live here, you were born in Austria, you can do anything you want, you can choose any profession you like. Where is the equality between you and me? Guardate, l'anno scorso sono arrivati circa 170.000 persone dal Mediterraneo. Look, last year, only from the Mediterranean, there were 170,000 persons that arrived here in Europe. In seti, 28 paesi, continuate a fare allarme, arrivano tanti. Rispetto la Turchia, la Giordania, il Libano, niente. After all, you are 28 countries and you continue to feel alarmed, but com compared to Libya, to Jordan, to Turkey, this is nothing. 
perché fa comodo parlare di problema invece che mettere una strategia per risolvere il problema. Because it's easy to talk about problems instead of finding a strategy, defining a strategy to resolve them. Nel Mediterraneo, quella lambrusa <coughs> lontana da voi, continua la gente a morire. Quest'anno abbiamo, aper abbiamo aperto l'anno con circa 200-300 persone vittime. Due giorni fa, 10 vittime. Sono persone, hanno le chiavi di casa, la casa non c'è. Lampedusa seems very far away, an island far away, but people continue to, to die just this year. 200, 300 people have died at the beginning of the year. These are people, people who had houses, keys to their houses. They are victims. E non siamo contenti dell'operazione Triton ha messo all'Unione Europea, perché non è sufficiente controllare solo la frontiera. Dobbiamo parlare di persone, trovare le strategie per risolvere il problema. And we're not happy with the Triton Frontex uh, operation because it's not enough we're talking about people here. Lui l'anno scorso c'era un'operazione si chiama Mare Nostro, va a salvare le persone. Con quelle operazioni abbiamo perso circa 3400 persone. Anche c'era operazione. Immaginate con Triton fa operazione di controllo quante vite umane possiamo perdere. Last year there was the Italian Mare Nostrum operation where instead, instead of saving all of the people, three, about 3,400 lives were lost all the same, although it was a rescue operation. Now imagine how many more lives will be lost with Triton. E quante vittime volete arrivare per muoversi tutti insieme? Quante vittime vogliamo arrivare? Diteci un numero, noi li facciamo arrivare per farci muovere sulla vostra, la umanità di tutta l'Unione Europea, di tutta la comunità internazionale. How many victims, give me a number, how many victims will be necessary so that the European Union starts to act in concert? How many lives need to be lost? Give me a number. La Giordania, il secondo, il secondo campo del mondo, cioè la metà della popolazione, sono rifugiati. Voi, ma io sono solo noi abbiamo 170.000 persone, sembrava un allarme. Jordan, for example, second largest, so to speak, uh, camp of refugees in the world. Half of the population of that country is composed of refugees. And you're talking about the problem in Europe where there are only 170.000 refugees. This is nothing. Dove il diritto? Il diritto ormai è diventato come un romanzo. Bello leggerlo nei libri, nella realtà non c'è. But where are the rights? The rights seem like a novel today, something that is nice to read, it's pleasant, but it doesn't exist physically. Perché il problema è politica, è politica, è economico il problema è quello. Per questo noi andiamo avanti a dire queste cose qui. Because the problem is a political one, it's the economy, and this is why we continue to repeat the self-same sentences. Guardate, noi abbiamo cercato, se andate in Sicilia, spero, spero, spero vi vedo il 3 ottobre quest'anno, perché celebriamo il secondo anno della tragedia, spero tutti, senza a venire a pregare, spero tutti a, a, a vedervi anche a Lampedusa, a vederci con i vostri occhi, anche andare su di Sicilia. Noi abbiamo cercato di dare nome e cognome a tutte le vittime stanno in Sicilia, sono corpi con un numero, numero 2, numero 50. And therefore, come to Sicily, come to Lampedusa. This year we will again be celebrating for the second time on the 3rd of October, the day of remembrance and welcome, hospitality. I mean, there are all these victims there, they may be given Just they have now, they have just numbers, two or 50, but these people need to be given a name, a first name and a surname. These are people. Vi do un dato. Quando abbiamo cercato di fare riconoscere queste vittime, la maggior parte avevano il passaporto europeo. Io sono cittadino tedesco, io sono cittadino eh, norvegese, avevano cittadino passaporto europeo. Non ha avuto l'opportunità di portare il suo fratello o la sua moglie. Because these victims, many of them had a European passport, say, of Norway, of Italy, whatever, and they wanted to have family members to come and join them in Europe. Per questo, io non vi voglio rubare tanto tempo per anche i miei colleghi, però veramente vi invito, vi invito, e spero intanto, eh, noi, e anche Lampedusa, una delle vittime, sia 
dell'immigrazione perché arrivano e devono accogliere, sia della politica perché la gente fa la campagna elettorale su Lampedusa. I really don't want to take time away from uh, the other panelists, but really I invite you to come to Lampedusa to see for yourself, because this is really a problem, it's also a problem of everyday politics in Italy and also of an electoral campaign. E mi dispiace, non c'è anche qualcuno del governo eh, austrici. Le stesso momento di dare opportunità ai ragazzi di Lampedusa a portarli qui, a far vedere qual è l'Europa, come è, com è fatta, perché loro si svegliano la mattina, vedono barconi arrivare, vedono politici arrivare, loro sono lì in questa strada, fanno avanti in detto tutta la mattina e la sera. Sono cittadini europei, europei stiamo parlando, i lambudusani sono cittadini europei. Allora, cosa vogliamo fare? Also, I would like the young people of Lampedusa to come here to Europe because they live a very odd life. They see every day these ships arrive and they go to and fro from the port. They see it every day. And are, these young people from Lampedusa, they are European citizens. So, Anche i politici vanno a vedere. And the political, and of course it's a political question, the politi uh, politicians as well. Ok, io abbiamo, scusate, abbiamo anche una proposta di legge già al Parlamento italiano, speriamo che venga approvata la giornata della memoria dell'accoglienza, eh, visto che anche abbiamo un parlamentare europeo, noi stiamo cercando in tutti i costi a portare anche il livello europeo, per questo vogliamo anche il vostro aiuto. Mm. Chiudo qui, grazie. And we're also hoping for your help because there's a draft law in Italy that's going to be proposed to have this uh, one day of the year, the 3rd of October, the day of remembrance and hospitality. And hopefully this law will be passed and we we'll also need your help for that. Scusate, e spero anche invito, grazie ancora all'organizzazione eh, del congresso, spero anche loro un giorno tutti insieme organizzano anche un, un congresso a Lampedusa. And I would also like to thank all the organizers for the conference. I hope that one day we will also have a similar congress, a similar conference in Lampedusa. Grazie. Thank you. Grazie per essere messaggio. Uh, but I may say, hopefully, we are not creating migration to Lampedusa from the other direction. <laughs> I think we have enough problems <laughs> until now, uh, and I think a visit is quite another case. So far, many thanks uh, for your challenge uh, you brought to us. I think it's extremely important, sí. <coughs> and I think it is a good consequence if I'm asking uh, <coughs> Oliviero Forti from Caritas Italiana to continue. Such a, such a video. Thank huh? you very much. Uh, also, of there will be no movie. One minute. One minute. Just one one minute. minute, yeah. Is in this video, you get in the internet, we put all some name of the victim. It's all at the spot. Uh, بهيوات على غم دحينكم ما قطعتكم كاينو جن دمتم عوياتكم كتسمعو ولا أزنكم أنت شفنكم عوياتنا لعليو كان زنا نويحو كفلا يسوس part of Jesus كيروس كيروس you are Lord كسانت you are serene Onjit, the beautiful. Kidane, kidane, my promise. Keflom, keflom, he belongs to. Kahsai, my ransom. Lemlem, fertile. Litta amlach, God's day. Lula, pearl. Luul, prince. Medhanit, you are my medicine. Mellese, the answer. Is the name of the victim and the same. Same, in the same moment is the meaning of the name. 
is only one minute. But if you go on internet, you get all the film. Thank you again. I'm sorry for using a long time. Grazie. Uh, uh. The floor is open now for Oliviero Forti. Yes, thank you. Prego. Thank you to the chair. I have, as you know, a mission impossible because uh, I will try to introduce you in five minutes the situation in Italy and the role of the EU. It's not easy, but I will try to do, to do it. Uh, I want to say, as the first thing, that Lampedusa probably is, is only a metaphor of our society. It's an image. Right. The problem is not Lampedusa. We have other problems, and we are going to discuss about it. As my colleague said, Mare Nostrum operation expired, as you know, last year at the end of October. During these 12 months, Italian Navy saved more than 150,000 people from Syria, Horn of Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. I think, and Caritas Italiana thinks that this operation has been a great humanitarian one. Uh, for Italy after a dark period. Probably you remember when the previous government, Berlusconi government, decided to push back the migrants to Libya and uh, decided to sign an agreement with, with Gaddafi, Italy, through Mare Nostrum, demonstrated to be a civil and European country. So, in a few years, Italy had a radical change of art towards migration passing from refusals to rescues. Unfortunately, and you know very well, Italy did not the same in relation to the reception system of the refugees. Until now, our country has not been able to implement a sustainable reception system. At the moment, Italy can receive more or less about 60,000 beneficiaries, more or less one-third of the arrivals of 2014. And this has been possible thanks to the role of the so-called third sector, that is the civil society, NGOs, and humanitarian organizations, among which Caritas Italiana and other big organizations is surely one of the main actors. By this way, due to this lack of capacity to receive all these people, a lot of Syrian and Eritrean people arrived in our country during 2014, decided to leave Italy, avoiding their identification, and trying to move to Northern Europe, where they have relatives, parents, friends. These countries, as you know, are Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, Austria, and uh, that is why now we are facing in Italy a lot of Dublin applications. Because as you know, for Dublin regulation, all these people have to go back to Italy. And how about Europe in this context? To answer this question, it is useful to refer to the Syrian case, which is paradigmatic for us. We are actually dealing with an unprecedented humanitarian emergency we should question governments about the right measures of international solidarity to adopt and comfort millions of people fled to neighboring countries. At the moment, no European states adopted a significant measures regarding humanitarian instruments, as humanitarian channels or humanitarian visa to let hundreds of thousands of war refugees staffed at the moment within the Jordan, Lebanese, and Turkish camps enter our countries in a safe manner. The only way to reach Europe is to take a long, dangerous, and expensive travel through the traffickers. Why should we not save them from this destiny? How about giving them the opportunity to reach a safe country, avoiding tragedies, as the last one in February of the Libyan coast? The only way to fight the traffickers, often we earn by media that we have to fight the traffickers, but the only way to fight the traffickers is not to invest money in the border controls but implementing policies about safe and legal ways to reach Europe. 
At last, but not least, where is that spirit of solidarity which should animate all the European member states? Let me turn the attention to Bulgaria as a new European member state and at the 30 kilometer barrier built at its external borders to prevent the Syrian people enter Europe, as well as the same solution adopted by Spain in Ceuta and Melilla or a similar solution in Greece in the Evros region. This is the Europe of migration now. The incredible European answer to all these questions has been the implementation of freedom operation, whose, aiming, uh, whose aim was stopping the migrant flow from North Africa by reducing the rescue area from 175 miles to 35 miles. Unfortunately, Contrary to the expectation, the <coughs> recent figures talk about an increasing of arrivals during 2015, during the first two months of 2015, as well as a predictable increasing of deaths. The forecast of arrivals in 2015 present an alarming scenario. No less than 250,000 people arriving in Italy and 350,000 ones in Germany. In this framework, Lampedusa is only the gate of an old, entire Europe, unable to implement a European foresighted policy on migration and international protection. Therefore, it is quite bizarre to think that the real problem is Lampedusa instead of the rest of Europe. Thank you. Caro Oliviero, uh, many thanks for this contribution, describing the challenge which is existing, the heavy burden for Italy, uh, but also the lack of European solidarity or solidarity in general, which is, I think, the right problem. I think it is a challenge for Europe. Sometimes I think we are against more Europe. I would say on this field we need more Europe. And it is an interesting question to a member of the European Parliament, how can we create more Europe under these auspices? The floor is yours. Thanks. When, when I traveled here today in the morning, um, I listened to the radio news and I learned something new and interesting. We, we were talking about creating a safe passage across the Mediterranean Sea, 19,000 people dying in the last 10 years. I learned today in the morning that the Austrian state company who's building the motor highways, Aspinac for the Austrians, will spend 1.5 billion, million, a billion euro, is it now better working? Better like, should I start again? Mm -hmm. So what I learned today okay, in the morning, uh, when we're talking about safe passage, safe traveling. Mm. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, an Austrian company who is uh, building the motorways, highways, Asfinag, will spend 1.5 billion euro for creating safer tunnels so that people can travel with their cars through tunnels in Austria while we have 19,000 people dying in the Mediterranean Sea. They spend 1 million for sensors on the beginning of a tunnel to see if the cars have hot motors. One million. I have here a list, everyone gets the list outside. With humanitarian projects, what you can do with one million euros in Syria, Lebanon, Africa, and so on. And we spent, decided today, or the news is from today, one million for cameras who measure the temperature at the beginnings of Austrian tunnels. So if this is normal politics, I do not know what, what I don't know what this all is about. And this is how European politics is working at all. We do not care about the problem on the front line, and Lampedusa is a front line for European politics. It's um, far away. How can this work? I, I talked to the commissioner, uh, Avranopoulos, the, the Greek commissioner on migration two weeks ago, and he considers himself to be a commissioner to fight against migration, to protect Europe from 
migration. That's the impression I got. Yesterday or the day before yesterday, another 10 people have died in the Mediterranean Sea. And when he reacted to this uh, case, he said, we will have to work together with dictatorships in Africa and North Africa to fight this migration. We do not legitimize dictatorships, but we cannot be naive. We have to work with them to combat migration. That is what, what the commissioner said yesterday after 10 people died in the Mediterranean Sea. So how does this work and how can this work? How can you have in a democracy a system where the government or the commission can say, we fight people crossing the sea when they are actually dying in the sea? This is, of course you cannot say we are fighting poor people running away from a war, running away from ISIS, running away from the murders we do fight against children and women. You cannot say that. So he says, we are fighting the people who are smuggling and trafficking, who are smuggling uh, refugees. <clears throat> he's, he's telling the story as if there is something bad going on, as if people are putting refugees on a ship and harming them while they are traveling with them across the sea. And when these people are dying, they are not dying because of Frontex and the European policy, they are dying because smugglers and traffickers put them on a ship. That's the way how Frontex, the commission, and this commissioner tells the whole story. Unfortunately for them, the story they tried a couple of years ago, uh, that we have to be protected from terrorists, does not work because the refugees arriving here aren't terrorists and have not been terrorists during the last years. All uh, terrorist attacks in Europe from the last years have been from people living here since a very, very long time. So this story doesn't uh, work out anymore. Now they are changing to smugglers and traffickers and telling this story. You cannot, even the, the far right wing in the European Parliament, Le Pen, FPÖ and so on, they never blame the refugees themselves. They blame the people trafficking and so on, the business. You cannot blame poor people and then they understand that very good. And there is a second story in European politics which is even more important, uh, I think, and that is we would take people for humanitarian reasons, but there are much more people fleeing for economic reasons, and we cannot take all of them, and that's it's, uh, what makes it difficult to sort them out who is really a refugee and who is an economic refugee and just comes here to earn money and to have a rich life and, you know, the old stuff. The second story is remarkably uh, working well, and it's, of course, it's also wrong. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, of the big discussion going on against, uh, about the free trade agreement uh, with the United States and uh, investment uh, dispute settlement things. Now, we have the same mechanism in a trade agreement with Jordan when we're talking about refugees from Jordan and people fleeing for economic uh, issues. Austria has the same kind of agreement with 45 nations from the so-called third world, Belize, Guatemala, Jordan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and so on. As long as the European Union, and all Austria as a member of the Union, does economic politics, which is not development politics, as long as we are creating uh, trade uh, contracts and so on, which are extracting money from there, people will of course always follow the money and we call them economic refugees for things we kind of create in their countries and, and for problems we create sometimes when we do these contracts with the governments. But we cooperate with dictatorships, that's not a problem, as long as they're fighting migration. So I think this, this whole kind of politics is, it's not about Lampedusa and talking about how can we save the people on the last trip across the sea, how can we help them to arrive safe in Lampedusa. European politics has to be about how do we behave in this world so that people do not have to go to Lampedusa? That's the first 
and most important thing of European politics. And we are losing this battle in the media, in the public discussion, uh, as long as the strategy of the right wing is working with their victim blaming, as long as we allow them to talk about economic refugees, smugglers, and so on, as long as we do not put the pressure on ourselves, our political parties, and our system, which is causing this harm uh, in the world. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> As a former <coughs> politician, I dare <coughs> to add an additional question to you uh, to cover this theme because it's a very important question. You blamed uh, companies, uh, commissioners, and so on and so on, what they are doing. Okay, is right. But at the end, you touched only with one sentence a question, what about the public mood? I think it is not only the right-wing parties. Those Austrians knowing me are knowing what my relation to the right-wing party uh, here in Austria is. Uh, but I think it is to create a public mood that there is a preparedness to do something. Because I think if you raise the question by democracy, are you prepared to take the people? In general, they would say yes. But in reality, I think there's a great majority not to do the things. And you are responsible as a politician. You have to campaign for not only blaming people, but also saying what can be changed here. But you are completely right. But I think this so. was already, one sentence was already the mistake. It's not about asking the people, do you want to take all these refugees? I don't want to create them. And we, are not, we do not have this discussion in Europe at all. We will never, and I do not dare to win a discussion if Europe can't take every refugee of the world because it is already the wrong discussion. We have to, to criticize our politics for creating bad things. And that is something I take very serious because um, there is a reason why I mentioned this, this free trade agreement with the United States, which, which is a big issue in Austria right now. And it is very important. Every discussion I have on this topic has to end with, if we do not want this thing happen between Europe and the United States, why are we doing the same thing with third world nations in Asia, Africa, and so on, since decades? And you have to, do, to discuss this every single time uh, you're talking about politics, that's, that's how I, I understand it. And I think um, we will not change this discussion and this mood in five years or ten years. But we're doing it wrong and losing it since almost 20 years in Austria, I think. Uh, we have to change it in the long run. We have to, to, to go into the economic discussion of how do we create uh, refugees in the world. You are right, it's a long-lasting discussion, but obviously for a longer time we did something wrong. That's one of the questions I'm always raising to myself as a former politician, what did we wrong? So far I think it's quite important that the actual politicians are knowing what they are really doing. And beg your pardon, uh, you didn't answer the question, how can we change the public mood on this subject? No, I thought this was the answer. <laughs> That's not enough. I think concerning the trade agreements with Jordan uh, and so on and so on, you cannot change the public mood. It's deeper. It's a question of social responsibility in general. But okay, let's move now to the government. <laughs> Milady, it's mm -hmm. your job. <laughs> not easy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a politician. I am not a civil society representative. I am only a humble civil servant and all I can offer in this very difficult debate is some facts and I hope they're interesting. So thank you for inviting me uh, to this discussion. I come from the Austrian Foreign Ministry, and as you probably know in Austria, the main responsibility for asylum policy lies with the Ministry of the Interior. We are, as a foreign ministry, involved only in a marginal way in that we provide the um, uh, migration and asylum authorities with reports uh, on what the situation is in some of the countries of origin of those refugees and migrants. And uh, we also deal with uh, individual cases 
um, that is family reunion. So if somebody has already a status of uh, a refugee or some other international protection status in Austria, his uh, or her uh, family members can go to an Austrian embassy and apply for asylum in Austria. So um, we're not directly involved, and what I can offer is, is, is a, f a little food for thought. First of all, we have to be clear that uh, we have the mo probably the most unprecedented mass migration of all times. Uh, the International Organization for Migration reckons that one person out of seven or six on this planet is a migrant. So this makes about one billion people on the whole, out of whom only a quarter, that is 250 million, are international migrants. Compared to that, there is a relatively small figure of people who are internationally recognized refugees, that is 11 million, plus about 5 million Palestinians. So this is a very, very small figure compared to the right. entire volumes of people who are on the move. Um, legally, you have to distinguish between people who are recognized as refugees, who have the full status under the Geneva Convention, uh, people who are waiting to receive the asylum status, this is asylum applicants. Then you have people who have some other type of international protection. They are not refugees, but it is recognized that they can't be uh, asked to go home to their home countries. They are allowed to stay. And then we have this whole big figure of illegal uh, residents and, of course, people who have entered the country legally. The difficulty about the public debate, I think, is that all of this is mixed up. And that makes it even more difficult. That helps to increase the figures somehow. It also helps not only to confuse the public, but even to cause some kind of panic among the public. Among all these figures, which I have tried to collect for you, one is interesting as well, which is that out of all the international applications for asylum, there are 75% happen in the European Union a lot more than in North America, which I think is interesting. So we also have an entirely different debate about migration, asylum, etc., than what you have in North America. Some figures have already been uh, mentioned by previous speakers. Last year, uh, the Mediterranean was often qualified as the biggest mass grave in history, unfortunately. About 280,000 people entered the EU illegally. That was almost 40% more than the year before. And 170 out of those entered via Italy and a few via Malta. This year, 500,000 are expected, according to the figures we have so far. There has been a huge increase in these first two months of this year. Um, nobody knows how many are waiting exactly, to cross the Mediterranean, which, as has been mentioned before, is a very dangerous place. Uh, there has already been mentioned of, been of these two operations, first an Italian operation by the name of Mare Nostrum, uh, which uh, was a rescue and search operation in the Mediterranean, well beyond Italian territorial waters. Uh, that became too big an operation for Italy alone, and what they have now started, this is operation called Triton, uh, an operation of Frontex, which is the European Union External Borders Agency, which has been criticized a lot. Um, they are trying to adapt to the uh, experience they have made, but suffice it to say that in, in three months, uh, Triton have saved 20,000 lives already, and they have detained about 60 smugglers. Treatment will be prolonged. Uh, it appears that there are constantly new tricks and procedures being used. What we have now a lot is the so-called ghost ships, ships which are put on self, the self-driving ships without a pilot, um, whose uh, owners hope that um, people will be picked up by Triton or whoever in the Mediterranean. Uh, of course, the figures are much higher in the neighboring countries than what they are in Europe, even, even in the Mediterranean countries of Europe. In Lebanon, about a third of the population by now are migrants or asylum seekers or refugees. Um, the UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees of the United Nations, has calculated that that would amount to having about 
uh, 15 million refugees in France or uh, 17 million in the United Kingdom. So you have to, it, it would make about two or three million refugees in Austria. That is what Lebanon has. Criminal networks have been mentioned, of course, um, they are not the only, um, the only responsible, but they are, of course, benefiting a lot from what is going on. If you calculate that refugees pay four-digit figures for the trip and that they have thousands sometimes on a boat, that makes a lot of money and is not easy to stop and to, to get to grips with. So the debate is very, very difficult. The European Union, as has already been mentioned, has a so-called European asylum system, which, however, doesn't work very well. Um, in, like in many other policies, it's being implemented differently in different countries. Um, on top of the asylum system, there has been a serious effort following the tragedy in Lampedusa in 2013 to develop a policy which of course has a very strong angle on international cooperation, in particular with the countries of origin. Uh, they have tried to develop what they call regional protection programs, which is about migration programs with the country at the southern rim of the Mediterranean. Uh, so there are big efforts going on, but so far we don't really see that they result in very positive consequences. Um, it may be interesting to our Italian friends uh, to tell you uh, that Austria is quite um, is more uh, participating than many other of the countries. You probably know that 90% of all the asylum applications in the European Union are done in only 10 countries, out of which Austria. And we are number five when it comes to the per capita figures. And I must say, uh, per capita, we have a lot more than Italy has. In the year 2014, according to the statistics we have, there were 60, about 65,000 asylum applications in Italy, in a country with about 60 million people, so I repeat, 65,000. And in Austria, we had 30,000, which is a huge figure in comparison. And if you look at the figures we have for January this year, there were 1,081 in Italy and 3,503 in Austria. So we do have very high figures. And it does have a lot to do with the fact that the Dublin system doesn't really work and that people just move north. So what I would like to, to say uh, on, on behalf of, of Austria at this stage is that we do share quite a bit of the solidarity, I would say, because we do have high figures. Uh, we are also number three in Europe when it comes to accepting Syrian refugees for resettlement. That is people who have found an intermediate place in, in either Lebanon or Jordan or Turkey where they can't stay and they are being accepted in Austria. It is a small figure. We're accepting so far 1,500. But can you believe it? We are number three in Europe, when, right after Germany and Sweden. Our Ministry of the Interior has uh, developed a project which they call Save Lives. Uh, sounds good and is usually, uh, usually does receive a, a good response. The idea being that one should establish a system whereby the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, sets up uh, asylum centers at the southern rim of the Mediterranean in order to find out who are refugees in order to save this very dangerous trip from people and then to distribute some kind of distribution key among uh, EU member states. So that's a pretty good idea, most people would agree. They are now fighting about what that distribution should be. But at least a debate has actually started to go on. Now, um, all these things um, seem fairly convincing. The problem is, uh, the sources of these huge flows um, are nowhere near stopping. What we have in some of the countries of origin is extreme poverty, failed states, very often, uh, a system which is in no way attractive to people. Um, no schools, no universities, no jobs, no healthcare system, no public transport, a lot of corruption, uh, authoritarian regimes, 
Um, so maybe it would be a good idea to talk to dictators after all, but in the sense that not all the countries are that poor, or at least not all this, these countries would need to be quite so poor if they had a better governance. So this is the huge challenge, the very huge challenge, which is very difficult to take up and to actually be <coughs> successful on. Uh, I will stop here. I have found a very nice quote by Fritjof Nansen, who, as you probably know, was the first High Commissioner for Refugees, International High Commissioner for Refugees, before World War II, for the League of Nations, and he said, the right way of dealing with refugees is much more important for international peace than most other things. That conclusion of the 1930s is still valid today, unfortunately. Thank you. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you very much to Director General Elisabeth Tichy Fieselberger, uh, speaking uh, about the situation, what can be done by a government uh, here in this context, and what is really contributed. Uh, I think I may add, and I'm extremely grateful that you mentioned it a little bit partly. Personally, I'm convinced we are in a situation like it was at the downfall of the Roman Empire. The western part of the Roman Empire broke down by people's migration. Uh, and the people's migration, as far as we have researched on the subject, uh, happened by ecological changes, which we have, uh, was happening by fame and by failed harvests and so on and so on. And so far, I think uh, the whole map of uh, Europe, uh, maybe the Mediterranean area, was totally changed and we got a new mixture. I think we are confronted in this situation, and which concerns me very much, uh, how able are our political systems to deal with this? Uh, even, I may say, is a reality check existing? Or are we pushing uh, the things aside? I think to sleep better, or whatever we want, I think that's one of the tremendous uh, challenges. Uh, I think, therefore, this meeting is quite important to contribute uh, concerning this reality check, which for sure we need, and I think we all know, I may say, that all what we are doing is in limits, and it is not covering all the challenges existing. Uh, that has to be quite said. Uh, it's not a reason to say we cannot do anything, therefore let's go. Uh, that would be wrong, uh, but uh, I wanted to add it in this situation. So I may ask in the panel, are there any comments uh, from the partners here? No, it's okay. Mr. Forti, no? No, only about the, the figures on the incidence of refugees in Austria compared to the incidence in Italy. It's true what you said. But as you know, the economic and social situation of Italy. And when we recept an, uh, refugees, we are not only giving him food in this moment, that moment, but we have to guarantee a future to these people. And a lot of them have no future in Italy. This is the reality. You can agree or not agree, but this is the, the reality. And so if they want a better future, they can stay in Italy. They prefer to go in that country where the situation is better. And the figures in Sweden are from your point of view, probably worse than in Austria, because they have a high percentage than in Austria. And so this is the situation. And so we have to try to manage this one. The Greece is in a worse situation, because they have a few asylum seekers, but the situation, as you know, is so bad that they can't guarantee anything. It's not sustainable at social level. And this is the situation that we have to face at European level. Because if we believe that the Dublin regulation we can manage all these situations so the people have to remain where they, they arrive, and in particular in Italy, we can solve this kind of situation. Thank you very much. You are totally right. I think... Uh, can I say something? Not to balance... Just a minute. Okay. Uh, not to balance uh, what you said, but I think we have also to look at this, because I'm running around uh, every second or third day discussing the European situation, including migration. We have on the other side, in some richer countries, uh, in Austria, Germany, and so on and so on, a lot of movements against migration. Let's close the borders. That's quite a very strong movement. I think we can see, we can agree here, that's really horrible. But if you are involved in the discussions, I think it makes it a little bit more difficult, even to 
tiny questions like what to do with the debts of Greece. Uh, here you can see, I think uh, uh, you can have a judgment about Mr. Scheibel as you want, but in the background you have always to look to Pegida and Legida and, and such movements also, because politicians have sometimes a problem, they wanted to be re-elected, uh, which is not a, always an easy job. I know what about I'm speaking. Okay, please my friend. Thank you. <coughs> Il problema qual è? Non abbiamo una politica comune. Ogni Stato mette un'azione come vuole il Stato quello. Se noi ci mettiamo su un tavolo, se c'è una legge comune, almeno sui rifugiati, parliamo di diritto internazionale, non sono può negare a nessuno. Non sono quelle che succede, quelle che sta succedendo adesso. Pubblico. The problem is that we don't have a common policy in the, United, uh, in, in the uh, European Union. Every state works and acts independently. So the idea would be to sit down around the table and have, for example, common law about refugees and try to work out such a law. Un esempio, se andiamo in Grecia, il riconoscimento dei rifugiati 000,1. For example, if we take Greece as, as an example, we have a percentage of refugees which is minimum 0000.1. Se andiamo in Norvegia, in Olanda, completamente diverso. And in Norway, or, for example, in the Netherlands, the situation is entirely different. Allora, o ne parliamo, si risolve, o se no, ogni Stato dà colpa all'altro Stato. So, either we try to act concretely and try to resolve the problem, or we continue, each State, to point the finger at the other State. Come ognuno dice, sono più bravo di te, tu non sei più bravo. Saying, I'm better than you, no, I'm better than you. Secondo voi riusciamo a risolvere così? Or do we want do we really want to resolve the problem this way? We must get the solution. We must get the solution. We must discuss about this problem. We cannot go like this. We are in 2005. 15. 15. 15. 15. We are missing 10 years, you are totally right. <laughs> yeah, we are in 2015. We say the world becomes small. We have intern, we have communicated. Why cannot 28 countries discuss when we speak about the refugee? Is refugee. There's no discuss more. It's refugee. Oh, you cancel the law. You say, okay. I don't sign the Convention of Ginevra. Oh, you must say, okay, look, I think me I have more intelligence than you. Can you listen to my advice? You put, we discuss. But I think we cannot go and say, Italy re rescue but doesn't exist. Germany say, oh, I have 1,000 or 600,000 people refugee. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want no more. Spain say no, I have a problem. I am on, on the front of, 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 uh, of Morocco. If I, op if I do good law, maybe a lot of people come. Go Greek, say no, have people from Syria come. You go, is this a problem? But at the same time, as we do economical, interesting with this country. And at the same time, as we go on TV tomorrow, we'll do like this. Um, but under is different thing. Looking, we are discussing this moment. In the, in the same moment we are discussing this, people say, did you think after one hour I, I will be in life? Did, mm -hmm. did you think after, after five minutes will be killed? There's people living in this moment, in these conditions. Look, I swear, I interviewed last people one week ago, direct from Libya, are waiting to come here. You say, really, even we cannot go to the toilet. In one room, there's people like 200, in one room, in one apartment, like 300, sorry, 300 or 200 people in the same, children, women, the major part, we cannot say economical migration are from Eritrea, 
Somalia, Syria. People have the key of home, but doesn't have home. What we can give answer for those people? We want to go say, no, you are wrong, I'm the right. I think it's not the political. We cannot give answer like this. We must get the solution, if we like it or not. You cannot stop those people. Yeah, we can make war for the trafficking people. But look, for me, I am here. I'm happy to be here. The trafficking man, he, he, he was my passport to let me reach in this country. With that, that man, I, I will not reach, and I don't have the, 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 the opportunity to stay with you and give voice for those people. Thank this you very is much. the real time. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it is a real challenge also for our discussion. So far, it's the right moment to move to the floor. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> here the first one, I'm asking first of all to raise a question, second uh, to say your name from where you are coming, that we are getting a better human contact. Okay? My name is Michael Bubik, I'm from Diakonie, and we are dealing with refugees and asylum seekers here in Austria. We see about 17,000 a year in our offices. The first question, my impression is that we would be able to host much more of them if, if we would invest in them. Why is the politic not reserving in the budget for 50,000 asylum seekers and 20,000 recognitions? That would give space yeah, to say, we look after. Housing, we look after. Training for jobs, yeah, we would provide them. Why is that not happening? Yeah, to prepare for a welcoming society. And the second thing about quotas in Europe. Why are you dealing with per capita quotas? The same stupid thing happens here in Austria. Vienna is always capable to take in more, but we have per capita quota. That's why the Austrian quota is never functioning. The same is in Europe. It's according to capability what you have to take in. And that would help. And please stop with this stupid uh, Dublin regulation. It has been stupid from the beginning. It is stupid. It creates a lot of uh, misery in this Europe, stop it at once. Mm -hmm. I think it's the right question, but difficult to answer by uh, Mrs. Tichy Fiedelberger because it's a political responsibility and not of the administration. And not of the foreign ministry. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the foreign ministry is a part of a government as a whole. I think I'm totally always against saying it's not my job in the ministry. It's a general job of political responsibility. I would have said it to your minister if he would said the same as you said. But okay. uh, on, on, the, on the figures per capita, I mean, I, we just use it to make it easier. But what I really want to state in this context is that Austria is doing its bit. And I can you give a list of countries who do a lot less. And even if you take absolute figures and not relative figures, we are number nine in the EU. Mm. I think I want to, to, mm. to, to help mm. uh, Mrs. Tiche Fieselberger. I think what we need, and I raised this question also to him, we have to create another mood in the public. That's the real problem, I think. <clears throat> mm. Okay, others? In the background, in the background, and then after you. My name is Knoflach. I do not have uh, any affiliation to a party or organization. I'm just a citizen. My controversial question goes to any, um, to whomsoever feels concerned. What do you think about a military intervention to overthrow governments uh, who cause or increase migration? Um, that's a horrible question because we can see that bombing does not really help concerning the Islamic State uh, and so on and so on. I think military action is the last solution and it is never a solution. Uh, but this is my personal conviction. Uh, I want to say it in general. Please. Well, I, I don't want to not to say anything about it, uh, but you're absolutely right. I don't think that uh, I don't see a military solution to 
to saving lives and refugees. Uh, I couldn't even think about that. But what what I, to to be honest, what I um, also um, what we have to be honest about discussing is help for the people on the ground when it comes to fighting ISIS and so on. You know, but, uh, it's I was in, in Iraq in in last year and it's quite difficult to to tell families 20 kilometers away from ISIS troops to say I'm a Western pacifist. I don't think that fighting will ever be a solution when there are people who want to protect their family. Um, to help them to defend themselves is one thing uh, Europe will always have to consider in such a uh, crisis and humanitarian situation. That's, uh, and I think that's compatible with, with being a pacifist. Um, but concerning the refugee crisis and people crossing the Mediterranean Sea, we are doing too much military things when I think about Frontex and I don't think, I don't see a solution for that. Uh, if, you, I think about if you allow me, you are right. My comment was going in the direction that we are trying to stop it only with bombing. I think then you have to discuss the consequence, you have to go in with ground troops. I think that that we said quite straight. That's not a cozy message. Please. Yes, hello, my name is Christopher Friedrich and I'm a student from Vienna and in my spare time I'm working for the Emergency Response Unit from the Red Cross in Vienna. And I've got a question about, uh, for Mr. Fotti. Um, I totally agree mis with Mr. Brane about um, the topic that people cannot be stopped from trying to migrate to Europe because it's just such a such a big political mess down there that they all want to migrate here. Um, you said there need to be new measures or ways for people to migrate safely to Europe. And my question would be, is there somehow a solution or is there a, um, how shall I say, a approach or what, 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 what would your approach be to uh, guarantee safe travel to Europe? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think finally that we have to say that migration and uh, asylum is a huge problem. We can imagine to manage it only through a law or through an agreement. Uh, we, uh, we must have a multi-approach, different approach. Um, probably at the moment we have to decide that if we want to give an end to all these people or not. After this, we can think all together the way to give an end to all these people, to help to these people. And our proposals, not only from Caritas Europa or Caritas Italiana, but also from other uh, numerous NGOs, is to open this kind of humanitarian channels. We have to give the opportunities to these people to arrive in a safe way in uh, Europe. And we can do it because we have the humanitarian visa, for example. Uh, we have the resettlement, for example. And it's totally agree uh, when you say that some European countries implemented the resettlement, but a very few, few um, numbers. Percent. We have two, three, ten thousand people, but we are discussing about millions of people who are in need. Probably we can save the world. I know, I know exactly, but we have to decide for the vulnerable people how to um, give them the opportunity to reach Europe. So at the moment, we are trying to um, present at the, Europe, at the European Union these two kinds of proposals, humanitarian visa and humanitarian channels, uh, also resettlement and go on. Grazie. Uh, somebody was showing up, okay. Um, hello, my name is Peter Barreco. I don't have any affiliation with humanitarian work, but I have the question that we, you have said that there's more and more mass migration in the entire world. There was never more than in this current day. And understandably, if I was in the same situation and I would not have a future perspective, I would also want to migrate. But aren't all of these things just treating symptoms and a short-term, and I also say 30, 50 years, short-term thinking of, okay, what can we do for migration, which is a very valid question, but also 
what can we do to, so people would not want to migrate, which means to stabilize countries at home so that people would not want to leave. Is there any such things, is, are there any such plans? Thank you. That's a very essential question. Who wants to start? <laughs> It's the solution. <laughs> I have no solution on this. But probably, yes, we are going to face this problem for the next 50 years, probably. And um, linked to the previous question, I can say that if you want an answer about the um, military intervention, we have to see what's happened in 2011 in Libya. <laughs> if we want to try to manage in a better way, if we are going to uh, have a fight in, uh, in Libya. We are producing a lot, a lot of migrants. This is what's happening. And so probably we have to find in the country of origin and the country of transit the way to manage better this situation. And uh, after the uh, Khartoum, uh, you know, uh, pr um, the process, the proposal is to open a transit camps in these countries, in Libya. But we, at the moment, not agree, because if in Libya there is not the respect of human rights, how can you open this kind of camps in order to uh, decide who can arrive in Europe or not? And so this is the complex situation that we are going to face in the next future. Thank you. The member of the European Parliament. Um, <clears throat> One thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, stabilizing the, the countries where the people are coming from is not not one task to do because it's a completely different thing to talk about the situation in let's say Syria we have a civil war going on with a dictator and Eritrea or or I don't know maybe Senegal or even Iraq or Pakistan where a lot of refugees come from you cannot just say we are stabilizing countries where people are migrating here we have to find a lot of different solutions and um, the European or Western politics is, in our politics, this is not a high priority. The priority is to keep the border closed, to keep the Mediterranean <coughs> Sea closed, and not to, to let the people not cross the sea. That's right now the priority of Fortress politics. Europe. The, the Fortress Europe, exactly. This is why we are still dealing with dictatorships uh, and regimes like in Saudi Arabia. Also, they are creating a lot of, of refugees in neighboring countries with the groups they are financing there. Because we, we us, European politics thinks, well, that's a problem there, and when the problem comes to us, we create the fortress and the wall in the Mediterranean Sea and keep the problems out. I think, and I... It's difficult to say. I hope that because because there is so much, there are so much, so many people suffering from this. But as this 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 whole situation is getting ever more awareness, I really hope that in the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, European politics will change completely in this. And coming back to what I said in the beginning, that we get aware that we have to that it's much more important not to create any suffering and refugees in the Middle East than to have good relationship with the Saudi Arabian regime to get the cheap oil from there, which is the priority now in the region. We have to change the complete list of our priorities. And talking about priorities, we had now four men asking questions. Women would be good. <laughs> Okay, but allow me, uh, I think I don't uh, change my sex, but I want to comment on this. No. Uh, I, uh, think, uh, I think uh, here I may say the following, uh, and it is answering your question. I think we are living in a time of a tremendous change of the situation. As a dinosaur in the, in the context of age here, I may say the world is completely changing, and I may say my hope that the traditional nation state in which we are living is able to solve the problems, I think won't work really. And what we need is for sure more cooperation. I think that's a challenge for the European Union to be really powerful uh, to solve problems, which for the moment is not allowed by the member states, that to be said quite clearly. 
and also the problems of the international organizations. We have a lot of conflicts in the moment where the international organizations are not, do not really appear. I think, did you hear anything about the Security Council of the United Nations concerning Ukraine and Russia? What about the Council of Europe? I think they are all not really existing. I think, and here on this, we have to concentrate where are the instruments? And I think we need some inter instruments which are exceeding the nation state because the nation state is not any more able to do it because we have here a general development, even a global development happening here and we are lacking the instruments. We need this discussion. Beg your pardon for interfering. Uh, you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, the more important information is supposed to know, the, mo the majority of, of the refugee are not on this uh, what's called uh, developed country, is an in developed country. If you go Kenya, there's the big, big camp. If you go South Africa, there's the big camp. Jordania, I, I name it, but just you go inter to know. Really, a small, small percent people come to Europe. Uh, 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 that's, it, it really is too much sa sad you, you hear this from Europe. You it is not from yesterday. For long, for long, if you go to Somalia, Somalia for 30, 20 years still in war. There's war civil. But you just try to go internet, you and go see the camp of, of, of in Kenya, in South Africa. Those people even uh, doesn't have uh, what's called assistance, social assist, assist, uh, assistance. No social assistance. Yeah. See, the minimum uh, stipend, the minimum, quello che i normali cittadini tipo no. prendono no minimal income. su 200 euro, però riescono ad accogliere più dell'Unione Europea, più dei paesi industri industri industrializzati. Yeah. I don't know if you understand me. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hai fatto caso? <laughs> mentre parlavi. <laughs> mentre parlavi. Uh, the problem in, in Europe is politic, but the real problem Refugee is exist long time ago. I really, I hope, I hope to go and see by us. You say you take all the date of refugee in, in different country, and you compare for those poor country like no, I've yeah, been nominated like poor country. You will see how different between those country. That can give you really the imagine that we, what we are speaking now. Okay, please. Is there a micro available, first row? <laughs> what the cuisine? No, 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 no. That's uh, enough. <laughs> it's arriving. Um, yes, my name is uh, Susanna Kalitz. Unfortunately, you're going to listen to me in the next panel as well. I'm uh, from uh, Caritas Internationalis. Just uh, as someone who has been actually operational, in uh, humanitarian responses with large refugee situations, etc. I think uh, it was a very interesting panel. We have been talking and touching and mixing maybe some also of the arguments. So uh, mixed migration flow, economic migrants, refugees, uh, putting them asylum seekers, uh, refugee settled determination, everything in the same basket. But if you go actually today, especially those refugees that haven't been like the situation of Somalia that you're talking about in the Dab in Kenya, or those that are Somali stranded in Djibouti for now 30 years and they are looking for resettlement, etc. The majority of refugees, if you ask them, they're not looking to come to Europe. They're looking to go back home. The situation is, uh, I mean, yeah, they're no, escaping no, no. violence, <laughs> they're <laughs> <expe> <laughs> escaping a conflict. They don't want to go and they cannot go back into an insecure situation. But it's not that we are going to see uh, the 10 million, or sorry, the 4 million refugees that we have now uh, between Lebanon and, and Jordan all. Uh, running uh, into Europe or going to, to the United States. I mean, they want, I mean, talk to them and you will see that they will ask, they will say, well, our hope is that there's a situation uh, uh, resolved, we want to go back home. And this is actually one of the three durable solutions that, uh, that we have. So it's the voluntary return where the situations allow for this. And so I think that we need to be careful about this. This doesn't prevent what, uh, um, the facilitator, Mr. Busak, was saying, um, we need to find a common strategy for uh, migrations uh, in Europe. But this is the discourse that, uh, I mean, and I'm not that old, but I have been hearing it for the past 20 years. And it seems that actually the public, 
uh, is getting worse and worse, as he was saying, because even in the countries which were traditional countries of asylum, the welcoming uh, Scandinavian countries, today if you want to with, uh, win the political uh, debate and uh, be in the government, you have to have an anti-immigration policy. So I think we need, uh, here is where I'm seeing also uh, us, all these students that are here, we need to keep our politicians also a bit more accountable in terms of setting up a more welcoming, more human, more respectful and dignified politics uh, as well. And we have, it's not only the politicians that have this responsibility, but us who elect those politicians. Yeah, but the one I'm saying, why we didn't listen to Jordania and say, no, we don't want refugee, no, we must go to the border. Why we didn't hear Kenya? Kenya have for, for long, for long year. Like if you go check camp, is the big like city, city. People sleep, uh, live in bad condition, without light, without uh, uh, good food, without educations. A refugee for a long time, and have a lot, lot. I think Kenya. But why we are Europe? We are seeing we have law. We have, we have, we have. But at the same time, it's saying no. Refugee for us is a problem. That we are discussing. We are discussing for, about people. People are the same like you. People have family. People have uh, children. People have feeling. People crying. People suffering. The, like the same people like you. There's no difference between you and them because you are not you are more than intelligent. Only, I tell you before, only difference between you and them is paper. You born in Vienna, you born in Berlin, you born in Roma, but me, I born in, in Somalia or I born in, in Mogadishu. That is the thing we say. And the same time, we see those countries, in developed countries, receive more, more, more refugees than those developed countries, but in the same time, those people doesn't, what is called, lament, no? uh, se lament, no? uh, They don't complain. Eh. Come una cosa normale, cioè una popolazione di Giordania, il 50%, cioè, il 50 the half of the population of, Giord of Giordania mm -hmm. are refugees. You try to imagine Venna become the half of Venna if a refugee. Did you accept it? No. That is the problem. Yeah. We want to speak about this problem. We want to speak about these people. This is the, the reality. No, no, it's not a romance that is a, 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 a book that you can read, say, ah, in 2020, we reach like 200 or 1 million of refugees. It's not like this. The problem is happening now. Go, Syria, there's war. Somalia, 20 years is war. Eritrea, we don't discuss still this problem. In Chad, in Sudan. This is the problem. We must discuss about this thing. And you have the condition to know everything. Don't say, I don't, I don't know. You have internet, you have TV, you have everything. That if you want, you will know. If you don't want, you will not know. That is the problem. Even you, you know the history of this building. You know how it's important this building. Do you think the building is important than human being? Not. Human being is human being. Thank you, I'm sorry for... I think that's a question of reality, Jake, I mentioned. Uh, last opportunity. You are the last. We are getting a micro. Is there any chance could to give him a micro? Or uh, here? <laughs> I have a question. Pick a, pick a part, <laughs> ladies the first, then you. I, okay. I was not aware. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Stephanie Bay. First of all, um, to Ms. Titi Fisselberger, I'm not the opinion that we should think in terms like there are countries who um, do less than Austria. It's a fact that Austria does too less. And the same is true for Germany and many other welfaring countries in Europe. Uh, secondly, um, I think it's an embarrassing thing that that the fact of happening in Lampedusa, and I think it's our debt as uh, the European uh, Union and European countries to help um, these human beings, also um, referring to affairs that we had in colonial times as European countries. So um, why um, isn't it possible that all 
European countries get to a round table, as you have mentioned, sit together and um, form policies that will regulate these uh, refugee issues. I ask you personally, why, it is po why it is, isn't this possible? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a question for you. Well, from my experience, <clears throat> We do not have a majority among the responsible politicians. That's the true answer. There is no majority for uh, humanitarian politics on this issue, and for different reasons, uh, many more than you would like to think uh, just do not support this issue, and many others are afraid from pressure from right-wing groups and, and shift to the right. But um, the last thing should not be an ex uh, excuse. I've, from my experience, many more people than you should think just do not support uh, humanitarian politics when it comes to refugee issues. If you help a little bit with a couple of millions in Africa down there, that's pretty nice if it's not too much money. That's the reality of how how the political system right now works, and we have to change the majorities in the long run. That's it. Thank you. Last question. Hello, my name is Christopher Bartok. I work for the Austrian Research Promotion Agency and um, have worked for various humanitarian organizations before. Um, my question is actually more is about what you, Mr. Busek, and uh, Mr. Raimond addressed was uh, the public image of immigration. And I sort of have the feeling that, um, I mean, we are facing a lot of problems in economic problems, widening gap between rich and poor, joblessness in Austria and Europe. But uh, we have given the, the right-wing parties far too much space and we're actually always only reacting to what they're saying. There's always, it seems as in the media, there's always some incident which uh, is abused by right-wing parties, some arguments that are made by right-wing parties, and then the left and center-left only react to that instead of actively uh, promoting a more positive image of uh, immigration. So, for example, where are the statistics showing that uh, average per capita criminality, crim crime rates among immigrants are in fact lower than with Austrians? Or um, what uh, immigrants actually contribute to the Austrian financial system in terms of taxes, in terms of welfare, and so on and so forth. The right wing knows Credit how to abuse those negative Credit figures, Credit but it seems Credit. as if the left and the center left don't know how to promote the positive figures. Sometimes they don't even have them. Um, and so this is my question. Is there a way to sort of be more active in promoting a more positive image of immigration? And just as a comment to Ms. Tihi, I think using 1,500 contingency as sort of a, an excuse that we are doing our part is no less than appalling, considering that that's the same number uh, of refugees that drowned on their way to Lampedusa in just a couple of months. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, these are the figures decided by the government, not, not by me. I just reported about them. And what I wanted to tell you is that other, other countries take even... I mean, I mean I, I'm not here to defend government policy. I can give answers to factual questions. One of them is, how many do we take? We are number three in the EU. It may be too little, but others, others take even less. And it has to be said, this is on top of all the Syrian refugees who come by other means. And there's a lot more than that figure, of course. Okay, I think mm -hmm. the first part of your question is uh, really difficult to answer. I think it would be very good. Uh, that's an advice to the organizers. I think maybe at the next opportunity, I think you shall collect some politicians here. He's the only one uh, on behalf of the European Union. It has to be said that the Euro competence of the European Union is in limits. That's defending okay. you, I think, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I think it's going quite deeper, and uh, I tried to mention it, that we have to do something concerning the public mood. You are just, not agreeing? Just okay. a short, I'm agreeing just a short thing. Uh, I, 
Of, of course, I'm agreeing that we have to, to change the approach and the mood concerning uh, migration and that migration is not a negative thing. But there's one thing um, I'm, I'm, I'm watching going on and after two decades of discussion, I don't know uh, how to handle it, especially in Austria, and have no way to, to go against it. I never met a person who say, or, or one thing you, you actually quite often see is people saying, I know a person, a migrant, who is a very nice guy. You know that? The person I know is never a bad uh, person and, and he's nice, he's here since a long time, he speaks the language well, better than me sometimes. And, but the mass, the mass is something that is making people afraid. And right. you cannot argue with this and you cannot argue with numbers. Uh, this is what I learned, and it's not a rational discussion because I just saw a flyer about terrorists in uh, Wien Margareten from, from an article in, 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 in a paper a couple of weeks ago. You cannot argue with this because it's not uh, a rational discussion. Um, I really think that this is, I'm coming back to the same thing, it is a generational Think. I think we will need, uh, uh, like the rise of the of the new right, we will have to create a, a rise of a humanitarian, tolerant uh, movement who accepts that Europe is not white, Christian, male dominated, but a much more diverse society. And this will take time, and it's for all of us to change that. It's not something politicians can do top down. They can do the other thing top down, obviously, as we see in Austria. Okay, this was another kind of reality check. Okay, I think uh, we have extended uh, our time uh, over the timetable. So far, I have to close. Summary is quite difficult. So, for no summary, we have to make our summaries by ourselves in the different approaches. I have to say many thanks to the participants uh, at the panels. Uh, I think now, as far as I can see in the program, there's a break. Uh, and at 3.30, we are continuing under the title, Does Humanitarian Aid Prolong War? I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. <laughs>